Welcome back to Sociology 227. This is Emily Martin, video two. In this video, I've got three tasks. First, I'm going to introduce you to the life and work of Emily Martin. Next, we're going to look to the Foucauldian analysis of biomedicine and pharmaceuticals and the work of Nicholas Rose. Finally, I'm going to give you an example to make sense of that, and this will get you ready for your two-paragraph response. Let's do it. Here's Emily Martin, Professor Emerita of Anthropology at New York University. Emerita being the rank after full professor when you don't teach anymore but still do research. Martin's anthropology started with the study of Chinese culture. However, she's most famous for her work on embodiment, psychiatry, and reproduction, especially her book, The Woman and the Body, first published 1987, required reading in medical anthropology. Here I want to look to Martin's work on the anthropology of the pharmacon to show us how to make sense of the sociological stuff we talked about in the past video. So that, briefly, is Martin's career. Let's look to the piece you read today. This is a picture of the exhibit that Martin is talking about in the piece, the Cradle to the Grave exhibit at the British Museum. The paper you read earlier in Biosocieties was a talk that Martin gave there. The American pharmacon, Martin argues, is not simply found in the increased consumption of pharmaceutical drugs. It is found in the political economy of the global drug industry and drug testing, the way that we cultivate selfhood in relation to drug consumption, and the close relationship between psychiatry and pharmaceutical use. She opens with a quote from a film, trying to scare us from using drugs. In contrast to the past, where drugs warped our personhood, we can say we are fully in a pharmaceutical age. Pharmaceuticals, or other designer drugs, do not warp personhood, but their use more often comes to elicit who we really are. This, in Martin's view, is the North American Pharmacon. What I want to emphasize here in Martin's work is the effects of displacement. Whereas Pharmacon refers to both poison and cure, Martin wants us to explore the ways that we take on a particular understanding of drugs as beneficial additives that restore us to what we once were. When Martin talks about displacement, she refers to us discussing side effects as an aside, or something adjacent, or the mechanisms through which we determine the safety of drugs, testing on those who threaten their own safety in doing so. She's not saying this is a case of ideology. This isn't an inverted reality. It is the way things are. Drugs and personhood exist in a symbolic economy in our pharmaceutical age. This means embracing one half of the drug's effects and casting the other out of mind. Hence, displacement. So when we speak about the pharmaceutical person, we're not just talking about people who take pharmaceuticals, we're talking about the political economy of drugs, we're talking about the cultural imagination of what we are and what we can be, and ultimately, we're talking about the moral dimensions of pharmaceuticals, in line with the sociological analysis I presented in the past video. Next, let's look to the Foucauldian analysis to see how it differs somewhat from Martin's analysis. I'll quickly review Foucault's work, looking to his book, The Birth of the Clinic. It'll help us make sense of more recent stuff. In that book, Foucault looks to the transformation of medicine before and after the French Revolution. This has three aspects. The first relates to discourse, the ways we speak and act on the truth of a thing. Disease, Foucault argued, changed after the French Revolution. Disease was previously something to be charted as it ran its course through the body. With the birth of clinical medicine, disease was located in particular diseased tissues. This required new methods to intervene on the body. With the emergence of modern pathology came new kinds of diseased people to be governed and managed. Changes in our knowledge of disease required a whole new way of seeing disease and diseased persons. Before, disease was located in the charts of symptoms that the doctor couldn't do much about. Now, it is located in the body and diseased tissues. Both are ways of seeing, but differently. The modern one, Foucault calls the clinical gaze. So, new forms of knowledge, new diseases, new ways of being and acting on persons. Okay, so that's Foucault in general. Let's look to Nicholas Rose and how he takes Foucauldian concepts and applies them to the pharmaceutical politics we've looked at so far. Nicholas Rose is one of the most prominent current Foucauldian thinkers. He is also one of the founding editors of Biosocieties, where the piece you read appears. 
Rose is going to argue that we can apply Foucault's understanding of discourse, disease, and subjectivity to the way that we think about ourselves in the age of molecular medicine. So the truth regime, or form of discourse, that Nicholas Rose is introducing us to is that of molecular psychiatry and brain chemistry. Rose argues that neuroscience has opened up the brain for pharmaceutical interventions. What is now a common trope, that depression is just a chemical imbalance, previously didn't mean very much. Everything's made of chemicals. But, following Stahl's discursive shift in essential psychopharmacology, the language of receptors, brain chemicals, imbalances, action, etc., becomes the basis on which we think about mental illness and disease, whether we'd like to or not. So if I say SSRIs, or dopamine, or whatever, you all know what I'm talking about. Mental illness is no longer a disease of the mind, it is a disease of the brain. Think also about the way that we classify diseases, particularly the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Whereas many people now say the DSM-5 is classifying everything as a disease, we can't simply be romantic and avoid it. Rose is arguing that this isn't a scientific takeover of everyday life. He's saying this is another way of understanding ourselves, just as we used to understand ourselves religiously. Think about it. How many of you have souls? How about personalities? How about mental health? Do you have that? Rose is arguing that we have fundamentally shifted our collective identity towards neurochemical selfhood. In these ways, Rose takes Foucault's understanding of disease and brings it to our modern psychopharmaceutical age. To make sense of Martin's analysis of the Pharmacon and Rose's Foucauldian analysis of pharmaceuticals, I thought we would look to the drug thalidomide. I've done a little bit of work on the politics of thalidomide, so I thought it would be an interesting way to outline the kinds of perspectives that sociologists take towards the Pharmacon. Yeah, it's really infamous, but I'll go through the events. The compound thalidomide was produced by Kemi Grunethal in 1954, and was used by a lot of women around the world as a sedative to treat morning sickness. The compound proved teratogenic. That is, resulted in significant embryonic malformation in children born to mothers taking the drug, within the first trimester especially. Working independently, Australian William McBride and German Widukind Lenz first identified these properties, noting high rates of phocomelia in children born of thalidomide-using mothers. It was not until 1961, 1962 in Canada, that the drug was removed from circulation due to its association with these effects. This affected an estimated 10,000 children worldwide, 40% of them in Germany. Estimates vary due to terminated pregnancies. Ultimately, and importantly, the drug was never approved for sale in the United States. But there's more to the thalidomide story than simply a drug that caused a medical tragedy. There are contemporary thalidomide politics I want to explore here. This will give us pause to look at the three questions I introduced in the last video. In addition to the impact it has on embryonic development, it was discovered that thalidomide was an effective treatment for some forms of cancer, multiple myeloma, as well as AIDS wasting syndrome and some other instances. After the drug's initial infamy, the US Food and Drug Administration changed the Food and Drug Act so that companies had to prove that their drugs were efficacious, that is, that they worked, rather than that they weren't bad. In 1998, Celgene Corporation, a U.S. pharmaceutical company, wanted to produce the drug under the Orphan Drug Act. This put thalidomiders across the world in a position. They were in a space whereby the drug that had caused them harm would be back on the market, but the costs were particularly high to keep it off the market. Whether they liked it or not, thalidomide was going to make a return, and so they did what they could to make sure the drug was used in a way that would minimize the risks of children being born like them. When the company went to the FDA to ask to produce the drug in 1998, the Thalidomide Victims Association of Canada came and spoke at the hearings, making sure that people would know about the costs of the drug, as you can see here on the group's website. I wrote on the slide that it is still a disability issue because only recently did the Canadian government admit some fault for keeping the drugs on the shelves for longer than other countries. Many thalidomiders still alive today are part of groups that are contesting the narratives that the drug company and governments maintain, 
that the drug simply caused a medical tragedy rather than something they can do something about. That is to say, it is an open disability issue and not just medical tragedy because they are still alive and need money and material support. The point is that they are active in their victimhood rather than simply passive. This is a form of pharmaceutical personhood or Foucauldian subject formation. Let's return to the three questions that I asked in the first video. I said what matters is not that the drug works for us sociologists, but rather how we establish that something works. In this case, thalidomide worked to produce a particular state of affairs and continues to. But the point is how we know these particular things. In this case, the ways we know how thalidomide worked were awful and continue to shape the way that we think about the drug to this day. So, the point is not that it worked or not, but how does it do so in the shared world, and why? Secondly, the point is not to say this drug is safe or this drug is unsafe. It is obviously both. Safe in a particular context, unsafe in another. What matters in the case of thalidomide is the lasting effects that it had on the way that we regulate the safety of drugs in the future. The FDA's criteria for evaluating the safety of a drug is the one that Canada uses to admit most drugs to its regulatory regime. Finally comes the ethical question. The thalidomiders at the FDA meetings didn't really have a choice about the drug being granted approval. It was looking like, given the drug's useful qualities in treating cancer, etc., that it was going to be approved. But they did have to come up with a relation to the drug. They chose to use their status as a warning to those who were going to regulate the drug and wanted to be party to that system. They could have just left, but instead, they decided to work with the company and the FDA to regulate the drug's use, somewhat. What ended up happening was the association including a letter and a photo of a thalidomider in the drug's packaging. And they came up with a regulatory regime where no woman who was pregnant, or on less than two types of birth control, could take the drug. In effect, they downloaded the responsibility for the drug under purportedly risky women's bodies. Here, the point is not to indicate whether thalidomide is good or bad, but to show the kinds of moral attachments that arise in this goodness or badness. That's it for me. Now it's your turn. In two paragraphs between five to eight sentences in length and with reference to the reading, one, explore what Martin means by the pharmaceutical person. Two, following Martin's lead, use the example of a drug not covered in this video to explore the three questions provided in video one. Remember, for full marks, you're going to have to reference the readings. See you next week.